share some thoughts that uh, for me have been very helpful over the last while. Uh, I hope they're helpful to you. Um, a lot of it will be stuff you already know, which is great, and just a little firm of things that you already believe, and, and maybe some things as well around the application will be helpful as well. I really hope so. It's called the founder's mentality. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, I've had the good fortune of, this is my third year of, 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 of ha doing a class series. The first one, you'll never remember, but in 2016, yeah, you remember that? It was all about the greatest commandment. Yeah, absolutely. Chevy's had the tattoo and everything of all the scriptures. Yeah, good. That's on the left arm. Good. Okay, so that was, so that was, that was like the, the greatest commandment. That's where we kind of started. And, and that's really about loving God with everything we've got. And that's super. And then the second one was, well, what about, um, how do we do that? And that was about the Holy Spirit and being full of the Spirit and that the ministry that we're in now is greater than the ministry of fire and Ten Commandments and all that kind of stuff. And Moses' face that was dulling down because the Spirit, he was losing the strength of the, of the Lord. You know, that was his, the Old Testament. Now we've got the Spirit that just makes us hotter and hotter and hotter. So that was the set that was last year. So what's this year? This year I've gone to the second commandment. Amen. And a way of thinking about the second commandment, the, and the second is like it. So they kind of follow on, you know that because of the numbers. Uh, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Now it's not going to be the normal view on that. So bear with me. Okay. I hope it makes sense. I better start my clock or those will be here for a long time. It comes out of a lot of thinking around the outpost ministry where we've got lots of groups. I mean, fantastic about Salisbury. But let's imagine five people get baptized in Salisbury. What happens? They just wander around? No. There's a plan. What is the plan for those five people to then become ten people, to become twenty people, to become a thousand people in Salisbury? I was trying to do the maths of what half a percent of the population is. And imagine it's just half a percent of the population were disciples. Yeah. I was on the train going in with a colleague on, uh, oh, a couple of days ago, and we were having this deep chat about the business and all that kind of stuff. We were talking numbers and money, bada boom, bada boom, bada bing, all that kind of stuff, really exciting stuff, bada boom, 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 boom. And there was this awesome person in front of me, she just looked really great, and I was just chatting away, and I was looking at Oh, so it looks like an interesting business. Anyway, keep focus. Got up. It was Maritza. Oh. <laughs> I said, I knew it was your voice. I was like, yeah. I did know it was the back of your head, but this is awesome. Because this is, and they were hugging on the trip. The whole world, a disciple world. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. And you think about how's that going to work? Well, we're not the only ones thinking about it. It's, there's a book called The Founder's Mentality. It's a business book looking at the most successful businesses over the last 30 years. The ones who were able to return consistent value. And what they found was the key thing was that you retained the belief system of the founder of the business. In fact, the biggest challenge they found for businesses to maintain value over time through several business life cycles was the founder can't be everywhere. Sound familiar? The, they were losing touch with the purpose of the organization. They didn't have enough leaders to grow any further. So they'd go into a territory, have a great opportunity, but couldn't capitalize it because there was nobody to lead the business in that area. Talent was outstripped by opportunity. And then also there was a loss of sense of ownership as the leaders became bigger and the, the group became bigger. People felt distant. <coughs> yeah, so that's what they say the killers of a business. Good point, Chris. Now, Jesus had a plan. If only they read their Bibles, they'd be fine. <laughs> but they kind of don't, because here's the book that I've been reading recently, amongst other things, called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And he talked about, Coleman, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. So you think of source break, you know, it's fantastic. We're not just into, oh, we have these numbers. We want to help them become true disciples. Yeah. And to grow, because the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. But what he asked was, what were the principles that underpin Jesus' strategy, and to what extent are we following them today? So what I'm going to share with you is a very simple set of opinions that I formed, and that's all they are, is a bunch of opinions that I formed that I hope will be helpful to you based on that book, based on thinking about the outpost, and based on thinking about other things. This week, we're going to talk about the foundation. In the foundation, there's three things. The first is, Jesus had a mindset that the few would reach the many. The second thing was they were committed to Jesus and therefore committed to each other. 
And the third thing was they were disciples before disciplers. Next week, we can talk about their training method of Jesus, but I'm not going to share that with you yet. The week after that, we're going to talk about the purpose. And so it's, it's seven principles of how Jesus built his ministry so that if Jesus was in Salisbury, which he is, but if he'd been there physically, how would he set about building the kingdom from Salisbury? Or from Frimley, or from Sandhurst, or from Basingstoke, or anywhere else that the kingdom happens to be. But there's a clue, it is about going out to all the nations. That's spoiler alert. That's what it's going to be about at the end of the whole process. So let's talk about the first area, which is the few to reach the many. I was in India last week for a week, and um, it's overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. It's overwhelmingly beautiful. It's overwhelmingly flavoursome. <laughs> it's overwhelmingly smelly. <laughs> in great ways and not so good ways. And the poverty and the needs are overwhelming. And we got a chance to visit the Village of Hope. Just mind-blowing work being done there. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, and, but this sense of the masses in need is what struck me as I drove around in my air-conditioned beautiful car. The masses in need as I sat in my luxury. And Jesus, I believe God, when he said he came to seek and save the lost, he has the same view, but not about physical needs, about spiritual needs. Because the physical will go. God loves the physical. He cares for the physical. We should care about the physical, but it isn't primary. If you could save someone's soul or teach them a career, which would you choose? Simply, I believe we choose the soul. Because that's the eternal thing, not the career. I'm not saying they're binary, they're exclusive. I'm just saying, I believe God sees the physical needs and cares about that immensely. And we need to respond to that, and we do. But actually... I think the primary seek and save the lost pet was about the soul. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look. The first thing that I found as I was looking at Jesus is he had degrees of intimacy. <laughs> and, and this is really mind blowing. Jesus had a plan for who he would get super close to. There were the masses who stood at a distance, many of them, to listen and try to disseminate. And often they left and they came and they left and they came. The next level of intimacy was his followers. Jesus had a whole bunch of followers that weren't necessarily his apostles. They would go with him, but they weren't his apostles. The next piece, we've got the 70. We're going to talk about that next week. Then we've got the 12. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated as apostles. Isn't that amazing? There's this bunch of disciples that are closer than the masses but not his apostles. Even within the twelve, there's the three. <laughs> Man, that, that must have been really irritating. Man, I made it into the twelve, but there's a three. <laughs> the three that went to see, that scripture's about the three that were taken, the only three taken to see Jairus' daughter. That miracle. He only took those three. He didn't take them all. They weren't busy. They weren't somewhere else. He just took the three. And then, of course, we've got the disciple that leans across on his chest, the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Jesus worked through degrees of intimacy and degrees of connection because he needed to focus. Why? Because the sheep needed shepherds. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus' heart was moved by the masses. But why didn't God just create a mass movement? Why didn't he just create the Facebook or Twitter of the day? He's an almighty God. He could have done any of that. And then Jesus just messing about with a few disciples. Why? Because the masses are not the key. The few that knew Jesus and could replicate that was the key to us ending up in Salisbury. Chain of chain of change, not mass spike and then drop through the floor. 
you know, he had compassion on them. And also, John 2, he says, he didn't trust the mob. <laughs> Have a look at it later. It says, he knew what was in men, so he didn't trust them. <laughs> no. It's not about the mass. It's about the quality that leads to the quantity of disciples. We see that he selected a small number to invest in, to create a structure of leaders. Jesus, again, I, I encourage you to read the Gospels, read them from end to end, and you'll see again and again, he deals with the masses, and he goes down and down and down. But his intention with the few was to raise up leaders who could be what? With him. Jesus went up to a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they may be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Isn't that amazing? He's saying, look, there's all these people I could spend time with. Why? Well, everything that we know to be true about helping people says the smaller the group, the more effective the instruction. Everything we, let's put our children in classes with 100 people to one teacher. Anyone up for that? It's free. It's free. 100 kids, one teacher. We know. I was talking to guys in India. Why do people talk over each other a lot? It's just a cultural thing. He said, Chris, you've got to understand when we go to school, the best ratio you've got is 40 kids to one teacher. If you don't fight for your voice, you will not be heard and you will drown. I said, wow. <laughs> Imagine. My point would be, everything in real life tells us that and we try and do something different in the church. Think about that. Think about what it takes to train, to disciple, to help, to raise up. Jesus had a plan for Salisbury. It wasn't just, hey, it was planned. There was an idea to it. I just want to throw this out to you guys and see what you think. The next piece he says is, then he wanted to make them disciples. This is interesting, Jesus' prayer before he went to the cross, or the night before. He says, I pray for them. He's talking about his disciples, the apostles, the ones he spent his time with. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you and you are in me and I am in you. The amazing thing is, Jesus' plan was really straightforward. God, I'm praying for the ones you've given me, and they're going to go and teach people, and do you know what? You're going to give them people, and they're the ones I'm praying for. Not the world. I'm going to pray for the world. That's not necessarily exactly how Jesus would have framed that. Who are your few? <laughs> the end, this point is about who's your few. If this is how Jesus approached the ministry, it wasn't a general association. It was an intimate sense of the few will reach the many. Just, I call it the Becky principle. <laughs> This is from Sister Becky. She was taught this in, uh, when she just became a Christian and she was moving out from Norwich. And uh, this is Becky. Uh, that's how I see it. It says, you should always have at least of the following. At the very least, what they said. Uh, it seemed reasonable to me when she explained it. Someone more spiritually mature than you should be in your life. Oh no, but I've been around a long time, brother. You don't you understand? I do know. I get that. But find someone more spiritually mature is my encouragement. The next thing is peers who can share the journey. You can share the journey with. Because do you know what? Um, if I get with somebody who's my peer and we're trying to solve a problem, guess what we're doing? We're making up the answer. Because <laughs> we're peers. If I go get with JP, it's a totally different dynamic. <laughs> I'm like, hey John, what do you think? And he might give me some guidance that I might not understand or even agree with at some point, but you know what, it's a different dynamic than just, hey John, we're kind of fiddling our way through having our first only child, what do you think? <laughs> but I do need that, and you, I would encourage we all need that, and also we need to be helping someone become a Christian. Everybody in this room should have somebody that can say, do you know what, that is the person, because everybody in this room is a fisher of men, mm -hmm. and women of course. You get my, if, if those four are not in these three groups, I ask you to have a think about it. So, who are your few? The next one, commitments to Jesus uh, and each other. Amen. 
Who's yeah. looking forward to the royal wedding? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Three of us. Okay, there you go. Whatever. <laughs> Tim's a massive royalist. He's probably going fox hunting just before the event. <laughs> and, uh, you know, charging. <laughs> ben likes that. There you go. Anyway, yeah. she got baptised so that they could get married in the church. Yes, <laughs> All I'm saying is, this isn't exciting because it's uh, famous and in Hello Magazine. The hope is it's exciting because it gives the nation a chance to think, maybe there's that true, sincere commitment. Maybe there's that true, sincere love. What a lot of people read into it, I think why people get obsessed about it is because they read into this ideal mm -hmm. of a relationship. You know, distance is not a deal in relationships. It can have challenges. Communication is more important than distance. But the most important thing is commitment. And, you know, Jesus, when he went out and he called his disciples, he had a very consistent theme. He was a bit repetitive, Jesus. He said, come and see. Follow me. Come and see. Come, follow me. <laughs> follow me. <laughs> he said the same thing. Yeah. You, come with me. <laughs> and see what's going to happen. See, yes, he, 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 had, he had a selective intimacy and degree with different people, but those who he, were his few, it was all about being together. It was all about being connected. And what was amazing, Luke 8, he says this, he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables. You see, those who could draw near to Jesus saw something that those who were just one stage removed could only dream of. Jesus pulled them aside again and again. Guys, let me explain. I'm only explaining to you, not to them. That's amazing. The way he was asking them to be close, to be intimate. As the ministry and opposition grew, this was amazing to me as well. As you read through his first year, second year, and third year, you see that as the opposition grows, he draws closer to the few. And the rest play less of a role. Because most of them fall away in some senses, actually. But the closer, and as he gets more opposition, and even when he's getting bigger, he gets smaller. Jesus focuses in. He's not prepared to compromise. You know, as you see him in the last two years, you see him going on more walks. If you look at the map of Jesus' walks, they get longer and more so solo, except for with his disciples. You see that in John 11, 54, he's getting opposition. He says, they drew away and stayed together. In verse uh, 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 chapter 10, it says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. So this is the last way up time. This is the time Jesus is on his way. This is like on his way to his death. He knows this, right? And then he says, the disciples were astonished while those following were afraid. See? disciples, followers, people were going on this journey with him even though they weren't in the disciple group. Uh, again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. With Jesus saying this sort of stuff, no wonder people were afraid. But who does he call in? See, Jesus didn't just have a plan, let's say, in Salisbury or in any other part of the Thames Valley that for us to just be together as a sort of a, 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 a few of us, if you like, in these areas around the south and the southwest, what he also wanted us to be is there for each other at those moments with a level of depth that you only get if you're actually with each other. There's two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is quantity of time, kairos is quality of time. Mm -hmm. You only get kairos, quality, out of chronos. Yeah. Try parenting. Hey, I've only got three, 30, 30 minutes, so we're going to have really special time, son. <laughs> Try being a husband that way. Sweetheart, I've been away all week, but, you know, let's get really close. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whatever, we need to talk. We need to spend some time. We need to spend some time, and then you get the quality time. It's the same in small groups. The last week in Gethsemane, and, and in Gethsemane, basically all he did was spend time with his inner circle. Because he needed to be with the people that were closest to him. He didn't have a lot of time for himself. Because he, we're going to talk about that late, later, but that's because his whole life was being with others. 
in the ministry. And when he was with others outside the ministry, he was still with people in the ministry. He did the ministry with the ministry. It was the same thing. Because they were together. And the question is, do you have that deep sense of togetherness tonight? In a small, intimate group. And 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 I strongly urge you, this is my personal belief. I'm not saying it's an element of doctrine. My personal belief is we need, everyone needs a mature person to guide them. We need peers to share the load. And we need to be helping some people to become disciples. So the third thing is disciples before disciplers. Now, we're going to have a lot of fun with the word disciplers in the third week. This is the first, not next week, the week after. Anyone know that building? Some of you in uh, Basingstoke will maybe remember that. Ben was awake. Thank you, Ben. Tony, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. <laughs> yeah, you remember Karen. Yeah, I don't think you were even in the room, Karen. Anyway, okay, yeah. City, this is City Tower. I've been there. It's in New York. It is the most extraordinary building I have ever, ever been in. I loved it when I went, right? It was about two months ago. See, it's on stilts. It's because a church wouldn't sell them the land. So what they decided to do... <laughs> Okay, so you're not going to send me the the land, but you don't own the air. Is that correct? You don't own the air, but you own the land. So, hang on. Let's think about... Let's put some stilts and then put this humongous building on those. That'll work. As long as what? As long as the stilts are strong. Amen? As long as there's foundations. As long as everything as it goes up is joined together more and more and more closely. Cool. So you would imagine they were uh, like super duper on top of this, right? Because this looks pretty precarious. Um, What they discovered about a few months away from completion, they discovered that rather than being welded together, the frame had been bolted together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not an engineer, but even I know that's probably not as good (laughs) as the first option, which was in the plans. They did a survey and they estimated about 200,000 people would die should it collapse. They estimated that based on the uh, lack of welding, <laughs> this is bonkers, the, um, there was a, 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 the event that it would take to push it over was a 30 year event. You know they measure events in how many years on average it will take. What's the likelihood there's a, there's a 500 year event which is only once in every 500 years. There's like a thousand year event, you get the point. This was a 30 year event. So what do they do? What do they do? Well I'll tell you what they do, it's amazing. Of course, having a view on the bottom line, they immediately at night time ship welders in without telling anyone and do some work with the Red Cross uh, so that if it does blow over in the meantime uh, we've got a plan. (laughs) What they didn't do is tell anyone. So they just sort of worked away at night welding, that's welding I guess, um, and they um, had a plan in case it did fall over because windy season was approaching. They made it. It is an awesome building though to be fair. But the point would be, the structure, if the structure's not right, no matter, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Does that make sense? If the structure's not right, that building looks amazing, but you know what? For every 30 years, it's going to fall over and kill 200,000 people. That's not a good plan. Because you look great for 30 years. <laughs> but that last year, you're going to look really bad. And it can be the same spiritually. See, spiritually, if we're not actually disciples, what are we even thinking about discipling others? Right? That makes sense? But of course, here's the thing. How do we define being disciples? Is it our way or is it Jesus' way? See, that's the question. Uh, And that's what I've had to really wrestle with recently. See, there's the word disciple, which is a verb. Are you doing it? And then there's the word disciple, which is a noun, which is being it. Think, I really think about whether I am being it. <laughs> Forget whether I'm doing it. And the reason I was thinking about this was, as we carry on, Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was our one single mission. 
Go and make disciples. Everything else falls off that. If you think of a Christmas tree, in my belief system anyway, I believe that you've got a Christmas tree with a tree trunk and all the leaves and all the branches come off that. There's a whole lot of branches to Christianity, but at the heart of it, we're on a mission. We're a church that is actually super small amongst millions and millions of people that don't know Jesus. That's the mission. Now, I'm going to break that down in the Greek in week three, but bottom line, sneaks, spoiler, the point is disciples. And it's not a, a command, it's an action. The actual word there is a verb. It's that you are doing this. You are discipling the nations. That's the whole goal. But are you, am I, discipling the nations? I know we're doing stuff, but are we discipling the nations? Because Jesus wouldn't move them on to the mission in, uh, of the 70. He wouldn't send them out on their own. This was amazing to me. Jesus wouldn't send the disciples out on their own until they crossed the discipleship bit. <coughs> because until then, they didn't have anything to share. So it's worth wrestling with that, I think. Anyway, for me personally, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Jesus was defined by his willingness to obey. Obedience can be an ugly word, can't it? You know. And... Um, in John 6, though, 38, he says, he came to do the Father's will. And in Luke 19, he says what that is, which is to seek and save the lost. So therefore, John 13, it says this. I haven't got it up there, but if you've got your Bible, you could, you could have a look. I, I love this verse. John 13, it says, Jesus says, we're almost finished, gang. John 13, verse 15, it says, um, um, I, it's verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. That's, I'm looking at my own life, my own personal helping of people become Christians. And quite frankly, can I honestly say I have done for others what Jesus has done for me? Recently? No, definitely not. Now I'm busy. So I've set myself a little 30-day goal, right? So the goal is to share my faith with somebody every day for 30 days. You'll be amazed how weird it is and how much inertia there is at the start. Because, you see, I've actually invited my whole neighborhood. I can't just do that again. I could go to my neighbors again. <laughs> Say, hey, you know, we talked about it at Christmas. Are you, are you open now? Would you like to know about Jesus now? Or I need to go find some new people. That's what I need to go do. Like, whether it's the cashier at the co-op yesterday, he was surprised. <laughs> hey, man, do you live around here? No. Uh, yeah, I do. Cool. Do you want to go to church? <laughs> it was a good segue. I was so slick. <laughs> so awesome. Guy, today, I was before I got left for basic stuff, um, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to come to church. And he actually sounded interested. I was so shocked. <laughs> Because everyone else has been a bit like, no, 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 my church is the garage or whatever it is, right? You know, that's what people say. <laughs> but the thing I figure is, the thing I figure is, the question is, am I doing to others what has been done to me is my priority? Or am I thinking about all the baubles on the Christmas tree of the church, the baubles on the Christmas tree of the kingdom, which are good and important? Or am I actually in touch with the actual vine? And so anyway, he says that in verse, he says, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. You know, that is an incredibly powerful thought that we are here to be as Jesus is. I love the fact, we're going to talk about it next week. Jesus tells the disciples when they were in the 70, he says, go and tell people the kingdom of God is coming. His whole point was where we go, where we go, we're to tell people the kingdom of God is coming. Amen. Jesus is on his way yeah. to your life if you want to. Mm. That's an amazing thing. When are we, are we really on that piece is the question. You know, don't worry about being perfect. I have definitely and am definitely not. And I don't think any of us actually can say we are perfect. That's not the point. But the point is to keep walking in the light we've got. How many of us are walking truly in the light we've already got? Don't worry about new light. Just walk in the light we've got. But do the things that we know we should be doing. Are we personally remaining in him? The Bible says if we remain in him is to love him. That's where we're going. The first section of this 
is all about these foundations. It's all about these three things I'm suggesting. He pulled, pulled the few, get to the many. He was absolutely all about that commitment one to another. And then finally, he was about being disciples before we even think about discipling the nations. Let's make sure we're on that mission ourselves. And then next week, we're going to talk about how we train. Three key points from that. And then finally, we're going to talk about the purpose and the cycl cyclical nature of that. The fourth week could be a bit of a devotional for people to talk about what you feel like, if anything, you could apply from the, 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 the lessons of the last couple of weeks. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.